Bartlett University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we meet today. L'Université McGill est sur un emplacement qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rencontre et d'échange entre les peuples autochtones, y compris les nations Odenosone et Anishinaabe. McGill honore, reconnaît et respecte ces nations à titre d'intendant traditionnel des terres et de l'eau sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. So, I have a great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, um, Nicolas Cosoy, if I pronounce it half correctly. I was testing myself. Yeah, I'm working on my own name for. But um, so Nicolas is uh, works in uh, ecological economics. So these are two words that work well together for a large portion of the population today. But I'm old enough that when I was a kid, you had to choose, I mean, come on, ecological or economics. Uh, but so, so this is a great um, research topic. So uh, Nicolas is at the uh, the School of Environment. He's jointly appointed at McGill. Um, by the School of Environment and by the Department of Natural Resource Sciences. He's an associate professor uh, now. And, but he did his uh, undergrad um, in uh, Venezuela, which is where you come from. Born and raised, no? I was born in Argentina, raised in Venezuela. Okay, so I had partial intel, so I'm, I'm, I'm filling, <laughs> filling the gaps. Uh, but he did his PhD in, uh, in Spain, at the University of uh, Barcelona. Uh, he obtained his PhD in 2008. Um, and before joining McGill, uh, I was very involved. He was uh, part of the United Nations and was involved in the uh, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. That was a really huge uh, uh, assessment effort. Um, and so, it's over to you Thank for your talk. Thank you all for coming to this lecture, a, uh, this time in the day, at the end of our day, I, I change the title from governance to governhood. Uh, I will explain that later, so. <laughs> um, thank you for the land ac acknowledgements. I, I also uh, include Mine, I think it's vital for all of us to recognize <coughs> where we are and to respect the cultures and traditions that have been taking place in this territory for long. So, uh, this talk, we will start by asking uh, how do we manage our environment, then I'm going to try to tell you a story about vultures that will that will go walk you through a, 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 the different kinds of environmental management. I will then try to summarize it and a, propose a, a way forward, a different understanding and a different relationship with nature. So let's start. Who do we manage the environment for? Historically, depending on the culture we are from, we will have different answers. But it seems that the European tradition, we're managing the environment for our sake. It seems that they've been historically different approaches to manage the environment. At the beginning, we were, like, we were managing the environment for the king. So it was one person who was impersonating a uh, a deity, a god. Then we have, we were managing the environment for the state, for a group of people, but fairly anonymous. Then we started recognizing that the state is not, uh, not anonymous, but have different faces. So we start bringing, bringing more people to the discussion. And, I'm, and and I will try to show you guys that that is not enough, that we need to do more. We need to understand that we're managing the environment not for us, not for future generations. We're managing the environment for all of us, including other species, including the landscape. 
So we need to understand in this trajectory, in this recognition that we've advanced, we need to understand also what has worked before and what hasn't. So with that spirit, I would like to start by introducing to you the Berlin culture. It's a beautiful animal. It's a solitary, large, territorial scavenger that inhabits mountains from Eurasia and Africa. Feeds on carrion, small rodents and large ungulates, but has a very peculiar characteristic. 70% of its diet consists of bones. Nowadays, threatened a, a, is listed in the red list of species as threatened worldwide. In Europe, is extinct, with some species being reintroduced in the Italian Alps. But it's mainly getting extinct throughout the world. We're pushing this amazing raptor to extinction. But I want to zoom in and look at Spain. Look at the management of this of vulture species historically in Spain since the 60s until today. In Spain, from the a early, from late 30s. Till 75, there was a dictator, Franco. And in the 60s, he devised a law. A law to control environmental pests. <coughs> what was his objective? The objective of this dictator? To control pests altogether. Social pests, what he considered social pests, and what he considered environmental pests. For many years, he managed to eradicate social pests, what he called social pests, the, the people who dissent with a dictator, people who thought that another world was possible. Once those were wiped out, incarcerated, sent to exile, then he moved on to the environmental pests and vultures were part <coughs> of those. The law, the Frankist law, encouraged carcass poisoning, encouraged active killing of vultures, all of them, those species, to the point that Bird vulture disappeared from the northern mountains of Spain by mid 1960s. After the fall of the dictators, the fall, after his death, he never surrendered, he died. After he died, then finally other voices started appearing in democracy in the so-called transition. This is not going to be a talk about Spanish politics, but it's going to be about Spanish environmental politics related to the vultures. So a, in the a late 80s and 90s, there was a recognition that raptor species were not protected. Hence, a suit of conservation measures were put in place to protect raptor species altogether. Three <coughs> laws were put in place. Conservation of natural spaces, wet flora and fauna, a national catalog of threatened species, and a law on biodiversity preservation, trying to bring Spain up to speed to were a, to what was a, a laws and environmental regulations throughout the world, in particular the US and the rest of Europe. 
these laws were successful in stopping a extinction, <coughs> further extinction of other old vulture populations. That a vulture was brought back to Spanish mountains. However, something happened in the year 2000 in Europe. What could that be? What could have that? No? What, what happened in Europe in the year 2000? Macau disease. Everybody was trying to get rid of their livestock as fast as possible and as cheap as possible. So the European Union issued a directive and saying, guys, we have to be careful. This is a real threat to public health. So we, we will devise a directive. And the directive is going to lay down health rules concerning animal byproducts not intended for human consumption. So what happened? Every single dead domestic livestock must be removed from the fields and sent to incinerators. Obviously, that led to what? To a limited supply of food to vultures, and in particular, to bear the vultures. They didn't have access to carcasses anymore. The European Union recognized the problems of this directive, and they issued additional supporting laws that had to be established at the local and national levels. The, the intention of those additional laws was to guarantee the food availability for vultures, not affecting human health standards. So what was the objective of this? To set up feeding site, sites, special feeding sites for vultures. So if you go to Spain, you will see that vultures now are being fed with scrapes of rabbits from rabbit uh, industrial production. Vultures, you, you, can, you can sit down in a hide and see, and just you, you see handlers dumping a bunch of a, a, a rabbit pieces, and you'll see vultures coming down and feeding upon the scrapes of our industrial society. So it seems, if we look at the advancement in Spanish law with regards to what was initially considered an invert by the dictator and a pest to what now is considered a species that had to be protected, hence a bunch or a set, a plethora of, of, of laws should be put in place to secure the, uh, the survival of these species, it seems that more flexible mechanisms were put in place. We started recognizing the importance of the vultures. However, Market forces are very important. Hence, every single conservation effort that is linked to the vulture also has to show the economic benefit. We moved from certain environmental institutions and we from authoritarian, authoritarian environmental institutions such as the Frankist law, to conservation environmental institutions. When I talk about environmental institutions, I talk about norms, rules, traditions, the way that we relate. To. We moved then to utilitarian environmental institutions and amended these utilitarian environmental institutions with co-management utilitarian environmental institutions. However, who are we managing the environment for? Are we managing 
the environment for the sake of the vultures? Are we managing the environment for the sake of human groups who are interested in the vultures? The same questions arise. What is it that we're doing when we manage the environment? Yes, we pursue more flexible strategies. We brought all of those mechanisms of public administration in order to accomplish conservation goals. Realize values with regards of protection of species, but mainly managing environmental risks and impacts for the benefit of human society. It was no longer a dictator telling us what species is a pest and what not. It is no longer the state, an, an all-observing, a panoptic state that knows everything that is going to tell us what rules are good or bad. But it's going to be, it seems that these new kind of environmental laws, environmental governance, <coughs> is in dialogue with many different actors, human actors. So, so far, what have we learned? We know that hierarchy in managing the environment doesn't really work. If we manage to have a benevolent dictator, well, the vultures wouldn't have been killed, but you never know. With dictators, they might start in one place and end up on a totally different one. That's what history told us. Then, environmental regulations cannot be static, should understand the changes that happen in the, in, in the environment, the changes that happen in society, conservation laws, have a problem understanding that dynamic. And obviously, many laws or environmental regulations seem to be non-evolutionary. Where's the relationship with drivers of species extinction or species creation? What's the relationship with one species and the other? It seems that these Environmental institutions are not suited to respond to these elements. Yes, we have to acknowledge the inclusion of different human voices has been a great advancement, but it's not enough. It's not enough. The deterioration of our, of our environment continues, and it seems that human domination upon the other, the other being an animal, a plant, or the other being a human, continues. So I believe we need to start bringing different concepts. We need to start using a different language. What does it mean to be sustainable? What does it mean, sustainability? So for this, I would like to refer to a term, reciprocity. How does reciprocity forces us to understand sustainability in different terms? It's not that we're sustaining earth processes, earth functions for the sake of human society. We are in relation with earth, therefore we are responsible, we have a responsibility with earth. That is the important discussion that we should have and maybe reciprocity might help us arrive there. So, now to the, to the topic of, uh, to, the, to the actual issue of this talk. What is it that I mean with reciprocal environmental governhood? Why is it that I don't want to use, why I mistakenly used initially governance and now I recognize that it cannot be governance but governhood? <coughs> First of all, I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge that, that the work that I'm doing is very much inspired by indigenous, decolonial, feminist, and of course, ecological feminists. <coughs> that is my discipline. And I define reciprocal environmental govern, governhood 
the, uh, the following way. Humans are part of nature. Therefore, reciprocal environmental governhood places the concept of embeddedness and relational interdependence at the core of any policy recommendation to manage social ecosystems. Let's open a bit that black box. What do I mean by embeddedness? The economy doesn't work in isolation. There's not a notion of circular economy. There's not the notion of circular flow of commodities. Nothing is cir circular in an entropic universe. Maybe spiral, spiraling down. But circular, no. Nah. That doesn't make sense in our universe. Hence our actions and the way that we develop our relationship should respect that embeddedness in this universe. It should also respect that we're embedded on Earth. Hence we're not alone in this planet. Earth is co-created and we're part of that co-creation. Evolutionary co-creation. And that might help us advance the way that we relate with the other capital O with that. Let me bring you a quick example so it doesn't sound that abstract, hopefully. So uh, this is what I call go governing along with plants. Hernando, the, the, the the colleague you see in the middle, in the photo in the middle, he has a farm called Mama Lulu Farm. This is in Colombia. It's in El Quindío, one of the a provinces who devotes almost entirely to coffee production. So it's a one hectare farm. They practice permaculture. They're able to feed 10 humans on that on that a one hectare farm for generations. 38 years ago, they decided to move from coffee, from a coffee monoculture to a permaculture. It took them 38 years to see their dream fruit, literally fruit. No pesticides, no fertilizers, no outside inputs. What was the motivation, you would say? If you ask Hernando, he will say, well, first, it's, it's our worldview. The way that we were treating the land was not in agreement with our worldview, with our understanding of how we should live. Second, we experienced m a massive reduction of biodiversity. So he, to he told me a story of a, a how when he was a kid in this area, he used to see flocks of birds. Now, silence, complete silence. The silence of the pesticides, no? the silence of these coffee monocultures. And finally, it was Nico, if coffee price collapses, we don't eat coffee. What are we going to do with all of that, with all of those tons that we produce? No, no, no. We need to produce food. And so, we, we talked for many hours. There's one quote. I'm going to read it in Spanish and then I'm going to translate it, if you allow me to. Algunas veces me pregunto qué sucedería Si un día la vaca decide vender la granja y con ella vende a mi don Hernando. Uh, the translation is, sometimes I wonder what would happen if the cow decides to sell the farm and with it decides to sell me, don Hernando. So when I heard that, I was completely perplexed. It was exactly exactly the kind of notions that I was looking for in a reciprocal environmental governhood. Flipping the whole thing around. What if 
the animals that we consider our domestic animals, they turn around saying, no, 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 this is not the way that we want to produce. Enough. Enough of this. The objective of the farm. This is a translation, but more or less his words. In collaboration with our soils, plants, wildlife, domestic animals and humans, we do not produce, we do not produce nor exploit for surplus. We grow enough food so we don't rely on the market. His children have been to a, went to the university, all university de degrees. They are now doing master's degrees. They all have a, are vaccinated. They have access to health. They have an excellent roof. They have access to land. And they all keep, keep, keep on working on, on that. When I asked him, well, so how do you manage the land here? He looked at me, he's like, well, like, we don't really manage it. The land manages on its own, and the land tells us what to do. But the most important thing is that we have to eat last. In the whole, in, for the whole farm, we eat last. So all of a sudden, the food web is inverted. It's not that the the predators are more important, that we are at the top of that hierarchy, therefore we sh must receive that life form because it's ours since the beginning. No, it's like first here in this land we feed our soils. After we feed our soils, we feed the plants, then we feel, feed wildlife, then our domestic animals, and finally the humans. Does that work? Well, it's, it's been working for them. The experience of being in his land was an eye-opener. He challenged, in, in the way that he expressed himself, he was able to challenge the notions that I held dear. He was able to challenge economic production function without going to, to a economic school. He do, does not call that an economic production function, he calls it a life function, because he doesn't produce. He lives, and they all live together on that land. So what is it that they need in order to live on that land? Talent, knowledge, nature, and the economics of collective work. If we look at this, I would recommend you to read Soddy, Soddy's book, a Frederick Soddy. A, a, he worked here at McGill for, he stayed here at McGill for two or three years. And um, along with Rutherford, the two of them won the Nobel Prize of Chemistry. But he wrote ma two magnificent pieces, one on the story of money and another one on wealth, virtual wealth and debt. If you look at his second book, Wealth, Virtual Wealth and Debt, and you look at the production function that Sodi proposes, it's exactly this. <coughs> and I told Hernando, and I told Don Hernando, Don Hernando, this is, this is a Nobel Prize winner in 1924, said that it's like, I've never read a book in my life, but knowledge is there to be shared. What a beautiful, what a beautiful human being. What a beautiful experience. So what is it that we need for this reciprocal <coughs> environmental governhood? First of all, let me clarify now, why is it that I call it governhood and not governance? Governance is sitting on the table with humans to the side upon the environment. Governhood is sitting on the table with other species and decide collectively what is it that we're going to do with our home. That is the difference. 
So what tools do we require in order to establish that dialogue with other species, with plants, with landscape? Is it possible to really establish a dialogue and consider them equal to us? Why not? We should try, maybe. There are many experiences of that. I just told you one. Let's look at what I consider could be methodologies that, will, that should help us. Not really methodologies, but dimensions. Methodological dimensions that I believe a, a, a reciprocal environmental governhood should cover. One is physical reality. We should have a good grasp of physical reality. We must understand the chemistry of our soils, the chemistry of our waters, the chemistry of our oceans. We must understand the physical, the physical aspects of our soil. We must understand the metabolism of, our, of ourselves, of other species. We must understand that we are grounded on that physical reality. And we should keep on understanding and investigating that physical reality because it's absolutely beautiful and full of surprises. But we also have to dig into the emotional reality. Other beings have psyches and other beings develop emotions and have emotions. We must tap into that. We should stop considering that every single rule that we create has to be neutral. No, we can feel bad about it. We have to understand that other beings have feelings. It's not as what Descartes called when, when a dog was mistreated and crying. It's like the noise of a machine. The pain of the other is equally pain, and we need to understand. There is also spiritual reality for us, but there's also spiritual reality in the other. Animals have myths. Animals dream. What do, what, like, what's the dream of a plant? What is the myth of a plant? We need to start getting closer to that. And finally, there is an intellectual reality. There is accumulated knowledge, knowledges, different kind of knowledge forms that have been accumulated throughout millennia. And it's not only the humans who are able to accumulate knowledge and transfer that knowledge to other generations. We already know that. So, imagine that we live by a river, Salmon River, and we establish a relationship with the Salmon Nation as Mel would put it, Salmon are not resources. Salmon Nation is a life force. A life force that we have a relationship with. We don't own it. We don't own the rivers. We don't own the Salmon. We have a relationship with these worlds, and our laws are our responsibilities. Why don't we create? Why don't we imagine beyond what we've experienced so far? And understand that other societies have imagined differently, have dreamed differently. Let's understand that the whole is larger than the sum of the parts. A lichen is more than an, the properties of an algae and the properties of a fungi. It has its own emergent properties. What are the emergent properties of these new relationships that, we're, that we should establish? We don't know how what, what they will be, what those relationships will be. We don't know what the emergent properties will be, but I would like to invite you to accompany me in this journey and try to create new kind of relationships with the other, with capital O. Thank you.
two minutes. Yeah. I don't know. That was not too fast. No, was no I could repeat the whole talk. I mean, no, I, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, excuse me. On behalf of Brett Pass Museum and the Kind Age Lecture, I'd like to thank you. Oh, thanks so and much. also thank you to um, TV McGill, who's recording this lecture. <laughs> thank you to you, McGill. Thanks so much. Thank you. Can I show it? Of course. Oh. Mm, it's a calendar of minerals. <laughs> the mineral nation. We should establish that. We, that's that's crucial for us it's to establish. For the journey. Uh, for, the journey. Well, for the beginning. In the beginning of it. <laughs> Do we have questions for Nicholas? Yes. You you use the word govern hood, which uh, it's a new word for me. I, oh, I think it's a good word. Yes, they, Colombia, Colombia, for instance, they, a, I think it was three years ago or so, one, a, one judge in the Supreme Court granted legal personhood to a river. But it's different because what, with, with rights of nature and, and that approach that you're mentioning, and thank you so much for your question because it will allow me to further the kind of environmental institutions that we were discuss, uh, like discussing initially, uh, rights of nature, uh, it is still a human, human imposition upon the other. It is, uh, the, it is the human who are, who are conferring rights to that other and, in, and, 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 and wanting that other to have legal personhood. Isn't that imposing a, to a circle to fit in a square? It's like, yeah, you are a, you are a square. It's like, nah, not really. But, but a governhood is a new term. Yeah, I'm, I, I created it, and the idea is to spread it. So spread it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, well uh, uh, to say the obvious. Uh, for the one, uh, for the whole, well, for the food market, for one day, for the whole island of Montreal, you know, obviously a, a huge number of birds, mammals, and fish are killed for supermarkets and other stores. But uh, any one of us could have been uh, one of those birds, mammals, or fish with just a different arrangement of organic matter. But do you think? that the vegan path is one good way towards nature conservation to encourage veganism. Okay. Is it industrially produced, your vegetables? If, it's if the veggies you're consuming, even though you're not consuming meat, are industrially produced, I would say the environmental impacts of industrial production ugh, are, are huge, are immense. <laughs> Uh, obviously, the amount of resources that are required to produce a kilo of potato are way different than, are way less than for a, 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 to produce a kilo of a animal protein. But a, the problem is that it depends on how you produce that, how you produce that food. So I wouldn't say it's about, it's not about a diet. I would say it's more about how we produce the food stuff in our diet. Yes, it's okay to disagree. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I, I really like the, uh, y your vision is very like long-term. It seems it's like it's, it's, it's an ambitious, uh, uh, relationship to have, and I, I really appreciate it. It's also uh, something that my, my exploring of other cultures' relationships, uh, like I, I, I see very much your point that you're making there. Um, in terms of the more like immediate pressing moment, we're like it seems like we're reaching quite a a point of well, we've been at a point of no return for a while, but we're really we, we're running out of time fast to make any uh, any difference to. Uh, Challenging uh, climate change. Um, I'm wondering, with your experience with uh, like uh, uh, the economy and stuff, like 
do you have any sort of practical recommendations as to how we can go towards your vision, sort of right now and create this new future? Um, Maybe my advice would be recalling the words of Etienne Lavoisier in a voluntary servitude. Stop serving. Stop engaging. Stop engaging. Yes. And then. Just, yeah, just, there's one here and then after that, you. Well, so you were like mentioning the idea of like a permaculture farm as being a place that um, brings kind of like the, the system of nature and all of the different parts of it into the solution. So how can you see that being transferred to like a social um, like governance or governhood solution when like plants and animals can't communicate in the same way as humans? And like for example, permaculture was designed by like people over a course of time observing nature's systems and like like he's talking about like kind of the immediate immediate like need for action but like if it takes time to like observe in order to design how do you think we can be like communicating with nature well, definitely we cannot communicate with nature <laughs> at the speed that we are communicating among each other i think that first of all we need to slow down <coughs> I think that the, these <clears throat> this obsession for immediacy, I think that we need to get rid of because that is going to give us a, a, the illusion of satisfaction when that is not happening. Uh, I think that we need to align ourselves with the rhythms of the other. It's not that we have to impose the rhythm that we want upon the other. No, this is a dialogue, as it is a dialogue with multiple species, we need to be able to accommodate, to accommodate their rhythms. So, took 38 years, but he's there, and his family's there. So that is the example, and I think that the example is that it took 38 years. That's the beauty of it. It took 38 years to transform a monoculture to a fun functioning permacultural forest. It's not that long, really. It's, a, it's one human life pro project. It can start with us, each one of us. I'm a bit too late. Oh, sorry. especially in internally colonized countries like Canada, where, um, for instance, how do we apply this traditional knowledge in our national parks or provincial parks? Because I do not see anything happening here in Canada where we, where we have issues of jurisdiction, where we, are, you know, where we can use this very crucial knowledge to manage our natural resources. Well, Kimmerer, a, a First Nations a botanist, she, uh, in her first book, um, she, uh, she talks about, where are you? Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, she talks that traditional ecological knowledge is the twin sister to science. So the first thing that we need to do is that we need to recognize that there are different ways of knowing. And traditional ecological knowledge should be given a, a similar status as scientific knowledge. The way of, that we acquire a scientific knowledge is through experimentation, testing, rejecting hypotheses. It's not really that different to traditional ecological knowledge. The difference is the timelines. They have, they 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 are way ahead of us in terms in, in those terms. They have 
been practicing it for thousands of years. So how is it that we incorporate it? Well, let's actually start by recognizing that they, they are on equal footing. And from there, then the recommendations, then we have to change the way that decision makers understand and, and include that knowledge. Thank you. Yes. <coughs> your great talk. Um, I think one, one thing that maybe we have a um, preoccupation or a, we, we have a tendency to want to when we hear stories like this is to say, oh, well, that can be replicated elsewhere. Or how do we make this policy relevant? Or how do we, you know, as, as the previous question, several questions have kind of indicated. And so my question to you is what, um, I mean, are, is this a, something that, this, this particular example that you provide and the, the narrative around it, is it something replicable or is it something that has to be experienced and felt in order to be transformative? Because once we recognize something, we tend to destroy it by trying to, to, to like, uh, I mean, we try to think of it as the, the ideal example and replicate it elsewhere. And in doing so, we make it disappear from what it actually was from the beginning. And so, what is the tension there, I ask? I mean, this, that's my question. I think, uh, I think that Giuseppe Munda uh, has a key in that. Giuseppe Munda, he is a, he's an economist who specializes in decision making under plural values and under a high levels of, of uncertainty. And um, he, he's one of the ones who created a methodology of multi-criteria decision-making. Um, and he uses a term that is incommensurability. And uh, incommensurability <clears throat> places us in a, unique, in a unique space where, where Different, uh, there are different representations to the same object. There are different relationships that we can establish with that same object. And it's not in replicating an experience that we will arrive to the same values. We can learn from that experience and we can try to execute a different type of relationship having that other one in mind as a spirit. Maybe what we can do is that we can, we can, we can hold discussions with Hernando, with his children, if we want to create our own permacultural experiment, but it's gonna be our own, with our own history, with our own context. So the idea that we can take one experience and replicate it throughout the territory and arrive to the same kind of results over and over and over is not understanding complex systems, not, or not uncertainty, nor path dependency. So in, like in other words, I think that replicability of social ecological experiments is not a viable option for us but ex observation experimentation is a viable <coughs> option for us hoping that we will get that it's going to take us somewhere but we don't know what that somewhere is make sense So before I ask my own question, I just want to ask for a clarification for one of your answers. The um, person up there asked, any, do you have any practical recommendations for how we, how we go toward your vision? And you said to stop serving or engaging. And I was wondering with what? <coughs> stop, to stop serving and well, engaging? Well, I was, I was paraphrasing Etienne Lavoisier that he was 18 years old in the 1600s and so when he wrote about, about like, voluntary servitude and how we a end slavery and the way to slave and a, a the way that he discussed it is stop serving our masters. So what I'm saying is like stop serving our masters, the capitalist system, the consumer system. Okay, that's a good flow into my own question then. Um, so 
You said, uh, you mentioned the und undesirable characteristics in environmental institutions, hierarchical organizations, static, non-evolutionary. Um, I would argue that, that should also, those characteristics should also be avoided in social institutions, especially going on this theme that I think, I mean, I think uh, social institutions should begin to mirror the kind of environmental institutions that you are putting forth. Um, I was wondering though, how do you plan to, or are you currently reconciling your own positionality, being in a universe, like a prestigious university, or being, having the status that you do with what you're putting forth as like potential po like possibilities for the future, for future organization of society and the environment, as a part of society as a part of the environment. How I'm reconciling it? I don't know. <laughs> but like, to be sincere, I don't know. At least what we're doing is that we're opening a dialogue. And I think that that's, that, that's a good start. But a, to be sincere, yes, I'm torn. Many days I, I find myself like, really? Like, I'm not part of the machinery? Yeah. But at, at least we can have this space. This is a safe space to discuss new ideas, to challenge ourselves. And I hope that some of you who consider these ideas interesting, let's con like continue spreading them. There's no own, own ownership of ideas. Let's, let's, let's make a real commons out, out, out of this. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. And I agreed with, uh, I think, pretty much everything, but I did have some difficulty with the way that you uh, framed the discussion to begin with. Uh, so you were saying that there's sort of this progress from uh, people serving a single king to uh, sort of anonymous state into serving people more generally, uh, which sort of implies this necessary progress towards uh, better treatment of the environment. Uh, and no, okay. Uh, and then again, uh, I noticed a sort of a stage approach that you had that said, uh, there was sort of this fascist approach to the treatment mm -hmm. of the state, and then uh, afterwards there was a utilitarian approach, uh, and then after that there was more of a collectivist approach, uh, and you, uh, you framed it in a sort of descriptive way rather than a normative way, or rather than uh, differentiating that these are different approaches. It seemed as though there was a historical thrust, mm -hmm. uh, and from your expression now I can see that you, you disagree with that, but I was, my mm -hmm. follow-up question was, uh, if there is no necessary progress towards more progressive uh, approaches to governhood, uh, what are the primary social barriers that are in the way uh, for these sort of progress towards better approaches? Mm, very, very good question. Thanks so much. Um, the example I chose is because it allowed me to compare the different environmental institutions Yes, in a timeline. But today we can see authoritarian environmental institutions, utilitarian environmental institutions, conservation environmental institutions, they're not collective, co-management, utilitarian environmental institutions coexisting in the same territory and at the same time. So that is a possibility. What was your question again? <laughs> It, it seemed as though you were framing it such that there is this, uh, nec yeah. not necessary progress per se, oh, okay. but there is a progress towards uh, better ways. Okay. Of, uh, Ob obstacles. <laughs> obstacles. <laughs> okay. Um, what are the obstacles for, um, well, a, uh, the obstacles is the society that we're building. The obstacles is called power. The obstacles is called vested interests. The obstacle is called lack of imagination. The obstacle is called Fukuyama's end of history. You know, like, there are so many obstacles that we have to confront. But those are not unsurmountable. What I'm saying is like, yeah, they exist. Either we acknowledge and we overcome them, or we say, no, there is a, we can marginally change them. I'm not in favor of mar marginal changes. I don't think that marginal changes really lead us somewhere. We've, like I was trying to show you that 
in this, not between authoritarian to, uh, to utilitarian, but utilitarian co-managed from utilitarian. It is a progression. It is an idea of like, yeah, we're doing better, but still the environment is getting degraded and still the discourses that we're using is like, well, we are degrading the environment, but GDP is going up. So I would call that one of the main issues that is an impediment and a major obstacle for the realization of a of, 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 of more of an equal society between humans and equality among different species has to do with our capitalist system. But also, social, like socialism wasn't really much better with nature, let's admit it. I think it's this program of human domination, this obsession of we are, there's human exceptionalism. What is so exceptional about us? Like, give me one thing that we are great of. Oh, like consciousness. consciousness. Really? Do you, like, do you like? Do you think that other species don't have that? I would love, I would love for someone to speak scientifically on the subject. Well, it's, it's not. Okay. So <laughs> the, the, the but actually, what I would like, what I would claim, for instance, the other day, my partner and I were like, we were discussing this, and all of a sudden, I saw this. The, this documentary of Attenborough, you know, like, you know, before going to sleep, this voice, you know, suits us both. We're kind of like <laughs> dribbling by, by, like, within half an hour. But anyway, within, the, before that, uh, be, before falling asleep, uh, uh, he was talking about ants. And um, all of a sudden, this guy, like, some colleagues, a, uh, a, uh, discovered, it's not that discovered, they observed that ants are able to collect resin, spruce resin, put it around their nests, bring a tiny resin inside of the nest, pee on it, pee on it, it's like they don't pee, but it's like formic acid, they, they squirt formic acid on it, and that, and that results in, into a natural, antibi very potent antibiotic. So it's kind of like, eh, so we're not the only species who do pharmacopoeia. Then. There are other ones. Even ants do, do that. So what's so unique about us? No, we are able to transmit knowledge from generation to generation. Where we're not the only ones who do that. Uh, what else? Tools. Nah, many other species use tools. Mm, what else? Well, homes. Termites great, make great homes, not like ours. I'm like, come on. Like, so, so, what is so unique about us? No, it's that we are observing ourselves and we're so infatuated about ourselves that we're unable to see the other and the beauty in the other. But that's why we are here. This place is about the other. It's about life, so. Were you able to sleep after the documentary? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I, I was, I was like, able to sleep better. It's like okay, it's like pharmaceuticals are not in, on like are not aligned with us, but at least the ants are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, so before I thank, uh, so I have to thank uh, Nicholas for his talk. Before I do that, I would invite you to, if you have uh, questions, discussions, to keep that. Well, at the, at the reception, I have uh, to, to close now. Um, I invite you to do that at a reception. We have because. And it was a very challenging time. I have many questions for you already. I will talk to you. Right? Um, so thank you again.